Welcome back to Biotechniques on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss the basic ideas behind immunofluorescence or IF. So very similar to the Western blot, immunofluorescence is a technique that we can use to identify specific proteins, but rather than just simply looking at them on on a blot membrane like this, which we did in a previous video, we can actually see these structures as they might exist inside a cell, which is actually really, really cool. Um, the only disadvantage to immunofluorescence versus the Western blot is you actually need a fluorescent microscope to be able to see these at the very least. Um, but actually the process overall is going to be very similar to that of a Western blot. So in this example, we're going to use um, human alpha tubulin as our protein of interest. So we, we want to identify alpha tubulin. And alpha tubulin is actually going to be what we're going to look at in this IF image. So they're very pretty images. So we have a protein of interest, human alpha tubulin. Uh, this is a human protein, obviously, as I mentioned. And we have to have a primary antibody that binds to this protein of interest. So the way we're going to... Uh, name this is it's going to be primary antitubulin mouse IgG. Again, just to review a little bit of the things we talked about in the Western blotting video, IgG is the class of antibody. That's all it is. There's five classes of antibodies, usually for Western blotting, immunofluorescence, ELISA, it's going to be IgGs that we use, okay? Also because they tend to be very, very specific antibodies. It's a mouse antibody, and we want it to be a different species uh, from the protein of interest because a mouse antibody is not going to bind to a mouse protein. Um, we generally don't have autoimmune reactions, so a mouse is going to perceive a human protein as a foreign protein. And so that's why this has to be a different species of antibody than the protein of interest. We also call it antitubulin because the protein this antibody binds to is tubulin. Okay, or alpha tubulin, so it's an anti-tubulin mouse IgG, and it's termed the primary antibody just in this context because it binds directly to the protein of interest. So it's primary anti-tubulin mouse IgG. Remember from the, one of the previous videos that the part that directly binds to the protein, the specificity part, these are the variable regions. Okay, I could even bring those uh, pieces over here. Okay, so let's actually bring those over, and I'll kind of move those around. So. These are your variable regions right there. And also remember, um, I know I've got the FC region, here we go. The FC region is the part up at the top, which is the constant region of the antibody. We also have to have a secondary antibody. This is an anti-mouse FC IgG, GOAT IgG. Let's break that down. This IgG right here designates that this antibody is of the IgG class. Okay? They're generally all going to be IgGs. It's also from a GOAT. That makes sense, again, because this antibody is going to bind to the primary antibody. So they have to be from different species because a goat is not going to bind to another goat antibody. Or if this was a mouse, this mouse secondary would not bind to a mouse primary because they're from the same species. So this has to be from a different species. It could be a goat. It could be a rabbit, just as long as it's different. And this antibody is an anti-mouse FC IgG. What this means is it's going to bind to the FC region of a mouse IgG. So it's anti-mouse FC IgG. It binds to the FC region of a mouse IgG, which is exactly what I've got it doing here. And it's also the secondary antibody because it does not bind directly to the protein of interest. It binds to the primary antibody. Okay? So hopefully this setup makes sense. Now, when we did a Western blot, Western blots had the secondary antibody uh, conjugated to an enzyme. And that's how we actually got this band to develop. In, an, in immunofluorescence, rather than being covalently uh, conjugated to an enzyme, the secondary antibody is actually conjugated to what's called a fluorophore. So these are molecules that directly fluoresce, and the most common series are called the alexafluors. Um, alexafluors are extremely common. Here's, a, here's quite a few of them. We have like alexafluor 350, alexafluor 405, and these numbers after the name alexafluor designate the wavelength of emission, the wavelength of fluorescence. So if, for example, this secondary antibody was conjugated to alexafluor 532, 
That means if I wanted to detect the protein and measure that protein on, uh, on the microscope and look at it, I'd have to set my, uh, my microscope to detecting fluorescence at 532 nanometers. Likewise, if my, if my Alexa Fluor was Alexa Fluor 594, I'd have to set the wavelength that I'm detecting at to be 594 nanometers on the microscope. And this also just shows the fluorescence emission of the various Alexa Fluors. And what we find is that there's a lot of different ones that you can actually conjugate to the secondary antibody. And which one you use really just depends on the availability and also if there's any specific colors that you want. Okay. Now, again, just like the Western blot, there's going to be several different steps here. Okay, um, Generally, you are going to block. There is a blocking step. Um, it's usually not going to be casein as it was in the Western blot. In the immunofluorescence, generally it's BSA, bovine serum albumin. Um, but the rest of the steps are the same. You'll have a wash step after that, incubate with the primary antibody, a wash step after that, incubate with the secondary antibody, um, and then generally you can wash and then and then visualize with the microscope. The reason you have the wash steps is to get rid of any excess antibody that didn't bind to the protein of interest. Because if you just have primary antibodies floating around, they'll, they'll show up as uh, fluorescing um, indirectly, be, even if they're not bound to the protein of interest. So you have to have those intermediate wash steps to get rid of antibodies that are not bound to the protein of interest. So ultimately what the wash steps allow is when you're done, Anywhere you see, at least in this case, green, that's where your protein of interest is. So when I look at this under the microscope, everywhere that I have green here, that's where I have tubulin because that's where I see the green fluorescence. If I didn't have any wash steps, everywhere where there's black here, I would see green. I'd see green everywhere because I didn't actually wash out the extraneous primary antibodies that were not bound to the protein tubulin. So the wash steps are critical. But Everywhere I see green here, that's where I see the alexaflor, and then that's also where I see the protein of interest. Now, something you might also see is DAPI. Uh, DAPI stands for diamidinophenylindole, and this is actually a stain that's used to stain DNA, and it's always blue. Um, so here I have... Uh, here's uh, DNA, and this is usually representative of where the nucleus most likely is, assuming it's a, it's a eukaryotic cell, but in this case it is because it's human. But DAPI is a stain that we use to stain the DNA, and that can also give some perspective of the protein of interest, particularly if that protein is associated with the nucleus, um, which in the case of tubulin, it is. Okay, so this is a typical IF picture, and the nice thing about IF is you can actually have other stains as well. You don't actually have to just use one stain, you can do it um, multiple ones and you can get more complicated images. And you can also choose, uh, based on uh, the, the wavelength of emission, you can only look at the greens, or you can only look at the DAPI. Or if there was a third stain, let's say that did red, maybe at a different wavelength, you could only look at that. And then you can create an overlay image where you merge all the colors together and that gives you the most perspective where you can see here's my DNA in blue, but it looks like the tubulin here is actually interacting with and surrounding the nucleus. All right, hopefully this video gave you the basic idea of immunofluorescence. Um, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. At some point, I'm going to put up another video where we're going to talk about the principles of ELISA, the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. See you then.